On to the next topic, labor organizations. What is a labor organization? A labor organization, which is commonly known as a labor union, is an association of employees created for collective bargaining or dealing with employers concerning terms and conditions of employment. The right to form or join a labor organization is available only to number one, supervisory employees, and number two, rank and file employees. Rank and file employees are those who are neither managerial nor supervisory. Supervisory employees are those who, in the interest of the employer, effectively recommend managerial actions such as laying down and execution of management policies, hiring, transfer, suspension, layoff, recall, dismissal, or discipline of employees. If the exercise of such authority is not merely routinary or clerical in nature, but requires the use of independent judgment. The supervisory status of an employee is determined not by the position title, but by the nature of the employee's functions. The point to consider is whether the employee has the power to effectively recommend the laying down and execution of management policies, including personal movement, using his independent judgment. Remember that supervisors and rank-and-file employees cannot lump into a single union. Although supervisory employees and rank-and-file employees are accorded the right to form or join a labor organization, they cannot lump together into a single union. They should form their own separate organization. The reason for the segregation is the difference in their interests. In the area of collective bargaining, their interests are not identical. Supervisors are the implementers of disciplinary rules or policies. Hence, they act contrary to the interests of the rank-and-file whenever they recommend implementation of management policy or whenever they ask for the discipline or dismissal of subordinates. If supervisory and rank-and-file employees are allowed to form a single union, the conflicting interests of these groups will adversely affect discipline because the supervisors might refuse to carry out disciplinary measures against their co-member rank-and-file employees. Supervisors' union and rank-and-file union can join the same federation even though supervisors and rank-and-file workers in the same establishment cannot lump together into a single union, the union of supervisors and the union of rank-and-file employees can validly affiliate with the same federation. Kinds of labor organizations We have here 1. Local union This is a labor organization operating at the enterprise level. Number 2. National union or federation This is a labor organization with at least 10 local chapters or affiliates, each of which must be a collective bargaining agent. Number three, independent union. This is a labor organization that acquired legal personality through independent registration and is not affiliated with a national union or federation. Number four, local chapter or chartered local. A local chapter or chartered local is a labor organization without an independent registration whose personality is derived from its mother union or federation. Number five, affiliate. An affiliate is an independent union attached to a national union or federation. Number six, industrial union. An industrial union is a labor organization composed of workers in a particular industry. Number seven, craft union. A craft union is a labor organization composed of workers engaged in a particular trade or occupation of a kind that requires skill and training. Number eight, company type union. A company type union is a labor organization composed of employees in the same company. Number nine, company union. A company union is a labor organization, the formation of which has been assisted by an act defined as unfair labor practice. Number 10, trade union center. A trade union center is a group of registered national unions or federations organized for giving mutual aid and protection of its members, assisting its members in collective bargaining, or in formulating social and employment policies, standards, and programs. Can a labor organization be an employer? A labor organization can be an employer. This situation arises when a labor organization hires employees to work for it. As defined in Article 219E of the Labor Code of the Philippines, the term employer includes a labor organization that acts as an employer. Labor organizations must be legitimate. To enable a labor organization to exercise its rights, it must first attain the status of legitimacy, that is, a legitimate labor organization. What is a legitimate labor organization? 
Article 219H of the Labor Code of the Philippines defines a legitimate labor organization as a union duly registered with the Department of Labor and Employment and includes any branch or local thereof. How can a labor organization attain legitimacy? Number one, through independent registration or number two, through affiliation with a duly registered federation. Is the registration requirement in accord with the Constitution? The law requiring the registration of labor organizations is not unconstitutional. The registration requirement does not curtail the right of assembly or association because the right of assembly or association can be exercised with or without registration. The registration requirement is a valid exercise of the police power, considering that the activities in which labor organizations are engaged directly affect the public interest. Suppose the union was organized as a corporation. Will it become a legitimate labor organization? The answer is no. A union that was organized as a corporation does not become a legitimate labor organization. Incorporation merely gives it juridical personality before the regular courts, but it does not entitle such union to enjoy the rights and privileges accorded by law to legitimate labor organizations. It is the registration with the Department of Labor and Employment that will make a labor union a legitimate labor organization. Can a union become a legitimate labor organization without undergoing the normal registration process? The answer is yes, by affiliating with a duly registered federation or national union, in which case, the union becomes a local chapter or chartered local. But take note, the federation or national union must be duly registered. What is the meaning of duly registered? Duly registered means that all the requisites for registration have been complied with. If the federation or national union was able to register itself without complying with any of the requirements for registration, then it is not a duly registered federation or national union, in which case, the local chapter that it created does not become a legitimate labor organization. An unregistered union that affiliates with a federation or national union is called a local chapter or chartered local. Who can create a local chapter? Only duly registered federations or national unions can create local chapters. Can a trade union center create a local chapter? A trade union center cannot create a local chapter. There is nothing in the law that authorizes a trade union center to create a local chapter. Article 241 of the Labor Code of the Philippines speaks only of federations and national unions. Take note. A trade union center is a group of registered national unions or federations organized for the purpose of giving mutual aid and protection of its members, assisting its members in collective bargaining, or in formulating social and employment policies, standards, and programs. Can an independent union affiliate with a federation or national union? The answer is yes, but under the following conditions. Number one, general membership meeting. The union must call for a general membership meeting for the purpose. Number two, approval of the affiliation. Majority of the union members must approve the affiliation. Number three, resolution of affiliation. This is to be executed by the board of directors of the union. Number four, notice of affiliation. This should be sent to the employer. Number five, report the affiliation. This should be filed at the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment that issued its certificate of registration. Note the contents of the report of affiliation. Number one, minutes of the general membership meeting. Number two, list of members who approved the affiliation. Number three, resolution of affiliation executed by the board of directors of the union. Number four, certificate of affiliation issued by the federation. And number five, written notice to the employer if the affiliating union is the incumbent bargaining agent. What are the legal effects of affiliation? Number one, when a union affiliates with a federation, it becomes subject to the constitution and bylaws of the federation. Thus, the federation can investigate and expel members of the local union based on the federation's constitution and bylaws. Number two, affiliation does not give the mother federation the license to act independently of the local union. It only gives rise to a contract of agency where the federation acts in representation of the local union. Number three, an independent union which affiliates with a federation or national union does not lose its legal personality. 
Thus, if the independent union disaffiliates from the federation, it need not register anew. What is the nature of the relationship between the federation and the local union? The relationship between a federation and a local union or affiliate is that of a principal agent. The local union is the principal, while the federation is the agent. In collective bargaining, the principal is the local union, while the federation is a mere agent. In case of illegal strike, the liability for damages devolves upon the local union and not upon the mother federation. This principal-agent relationship exists even if the local union is not independently registered. Can a union disaffiliate from its mother federation? The answer is yes, but to be effective, the majority of the local union members must approve the disaffiliation. When is the proper time for the union to disaffiliate from the federation? Generally, only during the freedom period, that is, the 60-day period prior to the expiry of the collective bargaining agreement. Exceptionally, disaffiliation may be done even before the onset of the freedom period if there is a substantial shift of allegiance on the part of the majority of the members of the union. What are the legal effects of disaffiliation? Number one, disaffiliation severs the relationship between the local union and the mother federation. Hence, it divests the federation of the power to represent the local union. Number two, disaffiliation terminates the right of the federation to exact federation dues from the local union. Number three, disaffiliation does not disturb the enforceability and administration of the CBA that was executed by and between the employer and the federation. Number four, an independent union which disaffiliates from its mother federation does not lose its legal personality because it has its own registration. Number five, a local chapter which disaffiliates from its mother federation loses its legal personality because it has no registration of its own. Number six, when a local union disaffiliates from one federation to join another federation during the freedom period, it cannot be charged with disloyalty because it is merely exercising its primary right to self-organization for the effective enhancement and protection of common interests. How can a labor organization be registered? To register a union, an application for registration should be filed with the following agencies. Number one, for independent unions. It is the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment where it principally operates. And number two, for federations or national unions, it is the Bureau of Labor Relations. Note the documentary requirements. The application for registration should be accompanied by the following documents. Number one, Statement indicating the name of the principal address of the labor union, the names and addresses of its officers, the number of employees in the bargaining unit, the list of members comprising at least 20% of the employees in the bargaining unit, and that it is not reported as a local chapter of any federation. Number two, minutes of the organizational meeting. Number three, list of employees who participated in the organizational meeting. Number four, Annual financial reports if the labor union has been in existence for at least one year, unless it has not collected any amount from the members, in which case a statement to this effect shall be included in the application. Number five, constitution and bylaws, minutes of its adoption or ratification, and the list of the participant members. Number six, federations or national unions should further attach to the application the resolution of affiliation of at least 10 legitimate labor organizations whether independent unions or chartered locals, each of which must be a duly certified bargaining agent in the establishment where it seeks to operate, and names and addresses of the companies where the locals or chapters operate, and the list of all members in each company involved. Number seven, payment of registration fee. Note that the application and the supporting documents must be certified under oath by the secretary or treasurer of the union and attested to by the President of the Union. The law does not prescribe a specific manner for its notarization. The documents may be notarized either separately or along with the main application. Wholesale notarization of a union's application for registration is enough because the effects thereof extend on the attachments, including the Secretary's certification. Note strict compliance. The certification and attestation requirements must be complied with strictly. Substantial compliance is not enough. Therefore, if the documents were merely attested by the union president but not certified under oath 
by the union secretary or treasurer, the omission is fatal to the acquisition of legitimate status. Conversely, if the documents were merely certified under oath by the union secretary or treasurer, but not attested by the union president, the union will not acquire legitimate status. On what grounds can an application for registration be disapproved? Number one, failure to comply with the certification and attestation requirements. Number two, submission of falsified supporting documents. Number three, if the organization itself is defective, as when the applicant for registration is composed of a mixture of rank and file and supervisory employees. Or number four, failure to submit the complete requirements within 30 days from notice. What course of action should you take if the application for registration is disapproved? Number one, if the application was denied due to incomplete registration documents, you can refile the application, this time attaching the complete supporting documents. Number two, if the application was denied on other grounds, it's an appeal of the order of denial within 10 days either to the Bureau of Labor Relations if the order of denial was issued by the Regional Office of the Department of Labor and Employment or to the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment if the order of denial was issued by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its original jurisdiction. Take note, orders issued by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction are not appealable to the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment. Such orders may be reviewed through a special civil action for certiorari with the Court of Appeals. When will an application for registration be approved? If all the legal requirements for registration are complied with, approval of the application for registration becomes a ministerial duty. If registration is refused despite compliance with all the legal requirements, the remedy is mandamus to compel the registration of the labor organization. The remedy of certiorari is not available because the act of approving an application for registration is not a judicial function but a ministerial duty. When does an independently registered union become a legitimate labor organization? Independent unions, including federations, national unions, or trade union centers, become legitimate labor organizations upon issuance of the Certificate of Registration. Can a union file a petition for certification election while waiting for the issuance of the Certificate of Registration? The answer is yes. An independent union can already file a petition for certification election while waiting for the approval of its application for registration, provided that the application has no infirmity. When does a local chapter become a legitimate labor organization? A local chapter becomes a legitimate labor organization when all the required documents have been submitted to the Bureau of Labor Relations, specifically 1. The Charter Certificate 2. The names and addresses of the officers of the local chapter 3. The Principal Office of the chapter and number 4. Constitution and Bylaws of the local chapter Can the local chapter file a petition for certification election before the submission of the required documents? The answer is yes. The local chapter can file a petition for certification election prior to the submission of all the required documents if the federation or national union has already issued a charter certificate to it. What is the legal effect of registration? Registration confers legitimacy and legal personality upon the labor organization. It enables the labor organization to exercise all the rights accorded to a legitimate labor organization. What are the rights of a legitimate labor organization? Number one, right to be certified as collective bargaining agent. Only a legitimate labor organization can be certified as collective bargaining agent. This means that before a union can be certified as collective bargaining agent, it must undergo the certification process either through a certification election or SEBA certification. Number two, right to request for audited financial statements. This right can be availed of only when the legitimate labor organization has already been certified as collective bargaining agent. But even if certified as collective bargaining agent, the right cannot be exercised any time. It can be exercised only during the freedom period if no petition for certification election has been filed by any union or during the collective bargaining negotiations. Number three, the right to sue and be sued. If not yet certified as collective bargaining agent, a legitimate labor organization can represent or file a suit on behalf of its members only if the legitimate labor organization has already been certified as the collective bargaining agent 
it can represent or file a suit not only on behalf of its members, but also on behalf of non-union members who are covered by the bargaining unit. A legitimate labor organization cannot represent or file a suit on behalf of the employees not covered by the bargaining unit even if the said employees sign the complaint. If a legitimate labor organization will file a suit, it should be brought in its own registered name and not in the name of its president. The union members for whose benefit the action has been filed need not be joined as party, especially when joining the said members would be cumbersome because of their numbers. A complaint for unpaid wages arising from a CBA may be brought in the name of the union that has obliged itself to secure those wages for its members. However, if the wages sought to be recovered do not arise from collective bargaining, the union per se would have no personality to sue for and in behalf of the employees because in that case, the real party in interest would be the employees themselves. In such a situation, the individual employees concerned should be indicated as party complainants. Number four, the right to own property. Legitimate labor organizations can own real or personal property, but the property should be used only for the benefit of the labor organization and its members. Donations or assistance from foreign entities to labor organizations or their auxiliaries for their trade union activities can only be done upon prior permission from the Secretary of Labor and Employment. Number five, right to tax exemption. Properties of legitimate labor organizations, which are directly and exclusively used for their lawful purposes, including income derived therefrom, and donations or contributions they may receive from local or foreign organizations are tax-exempt. The exemption may be withdrawn only by a special law. Number six, the right to levy of special assessments and extraordinary fees. Article 292A of the Labor Code of the Philippines authorizes unions to collect reasonable membership fees, union dues, assessments and fines, and other contributions for labor education and research, mutual death or hospitalization benefits, welfare fund, strike fund, and credit and cooperative undertakings. Note the limitations on the right to levy or collect fees and assessments. Number one, the fees, fines, or forfeitures must not be excessive, arbitrary, or oppressive. Number two, collection of fees or disbursement thereof must be done only by those who are authorized under the Constitution and bylaws. Number three, the officer or agent making the collection must issue a receipt and enter it into the record of the organization. Number four, the funds of the union must be used only for the expenses authorized. Number five, expenses must be evidenced by receipts from the person whom payment was made, indicating the date, place, and purpose of payment. Remember the concept of check-off. Check-off is the process by which the employer, on agreement with the collective bargaining representative or on prior authorization from the employee, deducts union dues, agency fees, or other special assessments from the latter's wages and remits them directly to the union. Note also the requisites for a valid check-off. To be valid, the check-off of union dues, special assessments, attorney's fees, and other extraordinary fees must be 1. Supported by an individual written authorization. Number two, duly signed by the employee. And number three, specific as to the amount, purpose, and beneficiary of the deduction. When is individual check off authorization not required? Individual authorization is not required to check off one, agency fees from non union members covered by the bargaining unit who accept the benefits under the CBA. Two, reasonable fees to finance mandatory activities under the Labor Code of the Philippines. What are considered as mandatory activities? Number one, labor relations seminars. And number two, labor education activities. Note those which are not considered as mandatory activities. Number one, compulsory arbitration of a collective bargaining deadlock is not a mandatory activity under the Labor Code of the Philippines. It is a judicial process of settling labor disputes. Therefore. Individual authorization is required to check off assessment for attorney's fees of the lawyer who handled the arbitration case. Number two, amicable settlement is not a mandatory activity within the purview of Article 2500O of the Labor Code of the Philippines to remove it from the requirement of individual check off authorization. Note the concept of continuity of check off. The right of an incumbent collective bargaining agent to check off union dues and agency fees 
subsists during the pendency of a petition for certification election and even during the pendency of intra-union or inter-union disputes and other related labor relations disputes. What is the effect of failure of the employer to check off? If the employer fails to comply with its obligation to check off union dues or agency fees, it cannot be held personally liable for the union dues and agency fees that it failed to deduct from the wages of the employees. The employer's failure to make the requisite deductions may constitute a violation of a contractual commitment, but it does not, by that omission, incur liability to the union for the uncollected dues or fees. No provision of law makes the employer directly liable for the payment of the labor organization of uncollected union dues or fees. Logic and prudence dictate that the union itself undertake the collection of union dues and assessments from its members and agency fees from non-union employees. Revocation of check-off authorization This need not be done individually. It can be done collectively because there is nothing in the law which requires revocation of check-off authorization to be done in individual form. Cancellation of registration The registration of a labor organization can be cancelled only by means of a direct action for cancellation. It cannot be attacked collaterally or indirectly in another action, such as in a petition for certification election or by piercing the veil of the labor organization's corporate entity because piercing the veil of corporate fiction is a collateral attack. On what grounds can the registration of a union be cancelled? Number one, misrepresentation, false statement, or fraud in the adoption or ratification of the constitution and bylaws or election of officers. Number two, violation of rights and conditions of union membership. Number three, voluntary dissolution by its members. The mere fact that some union members do not belong to the bargaining unit does not warrant cancellation of the registration of the union. The union members who are not covered by the bargaining unit will merely be deleted from the list of union members. For instance, if the bargaining unit is composed of rank-and-file field personnel, the inclusion of rank-and-file office employees as union members will not per se warrant the cancellation of the registration of the union. The office employees will simply be removed from the list of union members. However, if the union itself is composed of a mixture of rank-and-file and supervisory employees, Cancellation of the registration may be warranted because the organization itself is defective, considering that Article 255 of the Labor Code of the Philippines forbids the lumping of supervisors and -and rank-and-file employees into a single union. This organizational infirmity cannot be remedied by simply excluding the supervisory employees from the union membership. Who may file a petition for cancellation of registration? Generally, Any party in interest can file a petition for cancellation of registration of a labor organization. However, if the ground for cancellation is based on a violation of the rights and conditions of union membership, the petition for cancellation can be filed by the union members, specifically, number one, if the violation affects only a member, the affected member can file the necessary complaint. Number two, if the violation affects the general membership, the complaint may be filed by at least 30% of all union members. Where should the petition for cancellation of registration be filed? It is the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment which issued the Certificate of Registration for Cancellation of Registration of Independent Unions or Local Chapters, or the Bureau of Labor Relations for Cancellation of Registration of Federations, National Unions, Industry Unions, or Trade Union Centers. What is the effect of cancellation proceedings? The mere filing of a petition for cancellation of registration does not divest the union whose registration is sought to be cancelled of its legitimacy and legal personality. Once a labor organization is registered, it continues to enjoy its legitimacy and legal personality until its certificate of registration is cancelled with finality. Only a final order of cancellation can strip a legitimate labor organization of its rights. Therefore, during the pendency of the cancellation proceedings, the labor organization whose registration is sought to be cancelled can still file a petition for certification election, intervene in a certification election proceeding, negotiate a collective bargaining agreement, or declare a strike. What course of action can you take from an order of cancellation? It is an appeal within 10 days from receipt to the following agencies. 
It is the Bureau of Labor Relations if the case was decided by the Regional Director of the Department of Labor and Employment or to the Secretary of Labor and Employment if the case was decided by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its original and not appellate jurisdiction. Take note, orders issued by the Bureau of Labor Relations in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction are not appealable. It can be reviewed by the Court of Appeals only through a special civil action for certiorari. If a labor organization will voluntarily dissolve itself, what course of action should it take? It should comply with the following procedure. Number one, a general membership meeting must be called for the specific purpose of dissolving the union. Number two, two-thirds of the general membership must concur to dissolve the organization. And number three, an application to cancel registration signed by the board of directors of the union and attested to by the union president should be filed with the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment or the Bureau of Labor Relations which issued its certificate of registration. If a labor organization will change its name, what course of action should it take? It should file a notice of change of name with the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment in case of independent unions or the Bureau of Labor Relations in case of federations or national unions. The notice of change of name should be accompanied by the amended constitution and bylaws and proof that the change of name was ratified. What is the effect of change of name? Change of name will not affect the legal personality of the labor organization. The rights and obligations of the labor organization under its old name remain under the new name. If labor organizations will merge or consolidate, what course of action should it take? It should file a notice of merger or consolidation with the Regional Office of the Department of Labor and Employment in case of independent unions or the Bureau of Labor Relations in case of federations or national unions. The notice of merger or consolidation should be supported by the following documents. Number one, minutes of convention of all merging or consolidating labor organizations. Number two, list of their respective members who approved the same. And number three, amended constitution and bylaws and minutes of its ratification, unless ratification transpired in the merger or consolidation convention, which fact should be indicated accordingly. Take note, in case of merger, one organization absorbs the other, hence the legal existence of the absorbed organization ceases. What is the effect of merger? The rights, interests, and obligations of the absorbed labor organizations are transferred to the absorbing corporation. Take note, in case of consolidation, two or more unions are unified and a new organization is created. Hence, the legal existence of all consolidating labor organizations ceases. What is the effect of consolidation? The newly created labor organization acquires or assumes all the rights, interests, and obligations of the consolidated labor organization. When does an employee qualify for union membership? On the first day of his employment. Note the basic rights of union members. Number one, right to fair dealing. Union members are entitled to fair dealing from their union. Thus, the union cannot enter into a compromise without the specific individual consent of each employee concerned. The union can only assist them but cannot decide for them. Number two, right to determine major policies. Generally, major policies affecting the entire membership of the labor organization are to be determined by the union members through secret ballot. However, when secret balloting is rendered impractical because of the nature of the organization or because of force majeure, the board of directors of the labor organization may decide on behalf of the general membership. Number three, right to be informed of their rights and obligations. The law imposes upon every labor organization the obligation to inform its members about their rights and obligations under existing laws, including the prevailing labor relations system, the provisions of its constitution and bylaws, and collective bargaining agreement. Number four, right to be informed of financial transactions. Union members are entitled to full and detailed reports from their officers of all financial transactions of the union. Thus, the treasurer of the union and other union officers who have custody or control of the union funds and properties are obliged to render an account of all money received and disbursed by them within 30 days after the close of its fiscal year or when required by the majority of the union members and upon vacating his office. In this regard, union members have the right to inspect the books of accounts and other records of financial activities of the union. 
If refused access to the financial records, at least 20% of the union members can petition the Department of Labor and Employment to examine the books of accounts of the union. The right of the union members to ask for examination of the books of accounts of the union cannot be exercised during the freedom period or within 30 days prior to the election of union officials. Note the factor prescription. An action for examination or audit of union funds prescribes after three years, reckoned from whichever comes first of the following dates. Date of the submission of the annual financial report to the Department of Labor and Employment or the date when the annual financial report should have been submitted as required by law. Number five, the right to elect union officers. Union members shall elect their officers directly by secret ballot at intervals of five years. If the five-year term of office has expired and the union officers refuse or neglect to call for an election of new officers or where the constitution and bylaws of the labor organization does not provide for the manner by which the said election can be called, at least 30% of the union members may file a petition for election of officers with the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment. To be eligible for election or appointment as a union officer, the candidate must be employed in the company where the union operates, a member in good standing in the labor organization, and free from conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude, or if convicted, has been granted absolute pardon. Moral turpitude includes everything which is done contrary to justice, honesty, modesty, and good morals. Who are qualified to vote in an election of union officers? Only members of the union are qualified to vote in an election of union officers. Are union officers entitled to compensation? Union officers are entitled to compensation only when authorized by the constitution and bylaws of the union or by majority of the union members in a written resolution adopted during a general membership meeting duly called for the purpose. Can union officers be expelled from the union? Union officers can be expelled from the union for committing any violation of the rights and conditions of membership. In case of violation of the rights and conditions of union membership, a complaint may be filed with the following agencies. The Regional Office of the Department of Labor and Employment, if it involves independent unions or local chapters, or the Bureau of Labor Relations, if it involves federations, national unions, or trade union centers.